Funding for Inner Compass is provided by Calvin College. The life that's unfolding. The world that awaits. Gifts that are yours to explore. And God's to use. It's all happening here at Calvin. Welcome to Inner Compass. I'm Shirley Hoekstra. How much do you think we spend on space exploration as a nation? How much should we be spending? And what's it worth to put another person on the moon? It's been 35 years since someone last touched the moon's surface. Is it time to ramp it up? That's our topic today on Inner Compass. Join us. From the campus of Calvin College, this is Inner Compass, exploring how people use faith and ethics to guide them through critical issues of today. My guest today is Michael Griffin, the 11th Administrator for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA. He was appointed by President Bush in 2005, and he leads the NASA team and manages the U.S. vision for space exploration. Welcome, Michael. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. You know, some people don't even think, if you're younger, that the man, we actually put a man on the moon. Isn't that just surprising to you? Well, it's really kind of amazing since I, I know quite well all of the folks still living who, who did it. And uh, uh, some of them would say they're not bright enough to figure out how to fake it. And others would say that, uh, you know, two people can't keep a secret in Washington. Right. So, so how could there be a conspiracy? But the idea of lunar landings and this kind of new frontier, putting people on the moon, that has been lost a little bit with our last 30 years. Well, that's true. And, and that is, I think, infinite re infinitely regrettable. Um, that comes out of policy choices that were made 40 years ago in uh, the first term of the Nixon administration that uh, we had gotten to the moon, we had done it successfully, and uh, the Vietnam War was ongoing. Uh, uh, the space budget is in the part of, of the budget that is called domestic non-defense discretionary. It, it can be cut. And so they cut it. Okay. And we probably had other pressures going on. The We've, Vietnam War was going well, on. Well, the Vietnam War primarily. And, and so we made policy choices that I think were, were just terribly regrettable. Um, the trouble is that uh, NASA's a big ship, and uh, it turns only very slowly. Any organization in government has that characteristic. I think we Americans want our government to be stable, really. Oh, of course we do. And so when we make poor choices, uh, as, uh, well, whether we make poor choices or good choices, they tend to be around for a while. So after we lost Columbia, after we lost Shuttle Columbia in 2003, one of, uh, frankly, the most damning findings coming from that had nothing to do with the individual hardware and the proximate cause of the loss of Columbia, but it was the statement by the Columbia Accident Investigation Board um, to the effect that for 30 years and more, U.S. space policy had lacked a guiding vision. That's so, really tragic. Yes, so when you say that today there is a generation of people who don't know, don't remember, and in some cases don't believe that the United States ever pushed its frontier out to the moon, um, that is exactly the topic that the Columbia Accident Board was commenting upon, and, and it is tragic. Now, one of the benefits then, obviously, of a tragedy is a deep review of where an organization is at. And now, the President Bush said in 2004, let's get a new vision. And his vision is bold. It's audacious again, which is, let's go to the moon and not just put people on the moon, but colonize the moon and beyond. Well, I think colonize is a little strong. Uh, I think what we're, we're aiming at for the for the moment is an outpost. Okay. So think Antarctica in the 1950s. Oh, okay. Small uh, one, shelter, a couple right, of people. You know, or, or, or um, you know, think a fort on the western frontier okay. in Colorado in the 1870s. Think, think something like that okay. for starters. Uh, one people live there for a while though? I mean, are we thinking that we're, people could... We're talking, tour, we're thinking about six month tours of duty, just as, if, frankly, just as we do in Antarctica. Wow. Uh, but that's what we're aiming for, and then onward to Mars. And you're right, it's bold, it's audacious, uh, but I think that's what the American people want from their space program. Right. Um, it's not like we spend a lot of money on space. Um, Although people think that we do spend a lot of money, because well, you talk about billions of dollars. Let me comment on that. That is very interesting. People think we spend a lot. We don't. Let me actually give you some numbers. 
We spend $17 billion uh, a year in, in real dollars, 17.3 this year were appropriated for. That turns out to be, with 300 million Americans uh, in being, that is pretty much exactly 15 cents per person per day for the space program. Wow, that is astonishing. Now, I don't know about you, but I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I spend more than that on chewing gum. I would give a quarter or more. I'd give right. a dollar a and, day. And, and most would. <laughs> Now, the, so, so that's, an, I think, an interesting statistical fact. Now, another interesting fact is that when, when Americans are polled, as, as is frequently done by a variety of organizations, but just recently a poll was taken, and it turns out that the average American, the 50 percentile American, believes that NASA gets 24 percent of the federal budget. Well, that would be huge. Well, that's comparable to the Pentagon and would be about $500 billion. In fact, NASA gets 17.3 billion, or about six tenths of one percent of the federal budget dollar. Not even. But it actually produces <clears throat> a huge benefit to the economy. That was one it, of the astounding. It, it, it does. Right. But uh, but the point I was was working toward was that if we're only going to spend the little bit that we're spending on space, it's my belief that Americans want that amount to go for a bold, audacious program that puts us on the frontier, not something which is, you know, in the backwater. That's what we absolutely want. I'm going to speak as an American citizen. I don't want a weak vision, kind of a limping along vision. I want something, if we're going to be a leader, let's be the best leader we can in the space program. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, my perception gathered when I do everything from, you know, meet people on the golf course to speak at, on talk shows or at events like this, is my perception is that the overwhelming preponderance of Americans want the money we spent on space to be money spent on putting us in the lead on the frontier. Now, we do, we do share and collaborate. When, this, when the moon uh, program first was, we were competing with Russia. Now that competition angle has ended and now we are often collaborating with other countries who are also space explorers. Does that sort of take the edge off of this, we got to be the best? Well, not for me. Um, we, we today are, in fact, we're in the f final stages of, of building the space station, completing the space station. We're doing it with 15 partner nations, including Russia, our former Cold War adversary. Now. I'll make a couple of points that I make from time to time when I speak on these topics. Now, I think it is in the American character and nature uh, to lead and to wish to lead, and I think it should be that way. Uh, I yield to none in my belief that what we are going to do, we ought to do well, and we ought to want to lead. But leaders need allies and followers. And, and don't we need some of their innovations? I mean, we're no well, longer and, the and innovating we are, country and, we and once we are, were. We are all a nation of immigrants, okay? We are all a nation of immigrants, and I think we all know down deep that we don't have a monopoly on good ideas. Right. So allies and partners bring important things to the table. Um, but if we're going to lead, then there have to be others uh, at the party. So. That, I think, is an important point. Another important point is that um, space exploration is an activity that excites people around the world. Um, every nation, when it reaches a certain technological level and is able to begin indulging in spaceflight activities at one level or another, does so. Uh, they all want to partner with the leader in the field, which is us. All right. And. Um, you know, so the important point here, I think, is that space exploration is an activity the United States can engage in that attracts others to us in a good way, in a healthy way. We do many things as one of the nation's, or sorry, one of the world's leaders that others don't like, and we do them because we must. Space exploration is something we can do in company with others that they like. I think there's an enormous benefit to the United States of being engaged in large, visible international products that others look upon with favor. Right. They want to be then in communication with us. Yes. And, right. What, what is the value to the United States of doing things in company and in collaboration with others that they favor? I, I think it's incredible. Now you ask, how close are we to losing that lead? Well, 
precisely because of the observation of the Columbia Accident Board that I mentioned a few moments ago, that we've moved forward for several decades without a guiding vision, uh, we, have, we have, in fact, uh, lost some of our edge, and we have allowed other nations uh, and other coalitions of nations, so Russia, China, the European Space Agency, um, to begin doing things that uh, are closer to our capabilities, or in some cases even exceeding them, in a way that you know we wouldn't have done some decades ago. And, uh, and that, that is a concern to me. You talk about the pipeline, the pipeline of engineers, the pipeline of other kinds of scientists, and that is our pipeline where it needs to be. Uh, and that's another topic which I think is, is one that is or should be of general concern to Americans. Um, today, the United States is graduating approximately as many engineers as South Korea. Uh, that ought to be a concern. Given the size of the countries. Given the size, the, the relative population. size of the countries and right. all that. Um, a very sizable fraction of uh, engineering, scientific, mathematical grad, uh, grad students in the United States are of foreign origin, which was, has been true for decades. It was true when I was a graduate student. But here's the difference. They're coming here to get educated and going home. Right, they're not staying here. They're not coming here to get educated and staying here, right. as my friends from those years did. Right. Um, I think that should give us pause for thought. We Americans ought to want people from other countries who are good enough to come here and get graduate education, still the best in the world, we ought to want them to come here and stay. Right. We, we, are, we need to look at our policies to see to it that we are doing the kinds of things that get that kind of immigrant to want to come here and be here. And I want to go back again to the other <coughs> benefits, this economic benefit that happens. You called it the space economy. The 17 billion that we invest in the budget can turn into 220 billion dollars of space economy. And there's a lot of technology, something as simple as an ATM machine or a GPS system. All of those are byproducts of a space program. And yeah, you've written about a person who had a medical problem mm -hmm. who came to NASA and solved that for an individual. I think that the American public doesn't really realize the, the side benefit of that kind of innovation that happens because of space. Uh, most people don't. If there were a NASA meatball, or our logo, if the NASA meatball were on every product that has a, a NASA-derived technology in it, I think people would be stunned. Right, uh, and, and, and having a push out uh, audacious space program helps us to be excellent in other kinds of ways is right. Well, and that's a, a point I've, I've tried to make often because I, I think it's often missed. Um, one of the fascinating things about space exploration in all its forms it is, is that it is tremendously integrative. We need okay. so many different things. My daughter, uh, about to start college next year, wants to be a psychologist. And, uh, and yet, when she goes to aerospace events with me, she always says, you know, I, I like these women that you work with in aerospace. They don't take a back seat to anyone. Right. And they don't. And I said, well, you know, NASA needs psychologists, too. You can be almost anything. Wow. And the space program can use you. And it is tremendously integrative. So when you do hard things, that very hard things, hard things that are so hard that they're just barely possible, uh, and they cut across many different disciplines, dozens of disciplines, then you advance all of society. And part of the new innovations is actually a new kind of rocket and a new kind of capsule. We're not going to do the space shuttles, which were low orbit, low Earth orbit, but we have to have a new kind of invention to go back to the moon. What's that going to look like? Well, it's actually going to, on the outside, look a little bit like the old Apollo vehicles. Okay. Um, because, uh, and, I, and I, I get that question a lot, why does it look like something we did 40 and 50 years ago? Well, the answer is that uh, the physics of very high-speed atmospheric flight coming home from the moon and re-entering the Earth's atmosphere actually haven't changed in 40 or 50 years. It and works then, it works now. Yeah, and that physics is what dictates what the vehicle looks like on the outside. Now on the inside, to par parrot the popular commercial, this is not your father's Apollo. <laughs> uh, on the inside, of course, it's, it's nothing like the same. But um, so we're returning to a more of a capsule design, although it'll be quite a bit bigger than Apollo. Now so we're returning to a capsule design rather than a winged vehicle because right. our 
our task from the President and Congress is to return to the moon. So in, in 2010, the shuttles are supposed to be retired. We'll retire the shuttle in 2010. But now we won't have the, the new vehicles until 2015? Currently, early 2015 is what we're projecting with the budgets that we have. So what do we do in the five-year interim for our space station or anything else? That's a real popular question that doesn't have a, a very pleasant answer. Um, the very, the, the uh, best possible answer that we're going to get out of that one is that we will receive continued permission from the Congress to uh, buy rides from the Russians. Wow, that's a turnaround, isn't it? It is. Right. And I, it, I find it very unsettling, but as a result of prior decisions, that's where we are. Why can't we uh, rehab the shuttles and so that they can work for five more years? Well, we can, uh, but it's a matter of, and, and the other part of it is, well, why can't we build the new systems sooner? Right. And, and close the gap that way. Uh, and we could do either or both of those things. But they require money that um, uh, would be, NASA's budget has been pretty fixed in, in inflation adjusted dollars for the last 20 years. So it hasn't gone much up or much down in, in again, in real dollars. You, you have to right. account for inflation. So uh, if you're going to do things as aggressive as bringing, bringing online a new system while continuing to fly the old, you would have to have a budget bump and we've not received that. So we will have to finish out one system and then in an orderly way do the design and development of another and there, there will be a gap there at present. So it's really a matter of money. Now President Bush wants us to get to the moon by 2015. By 2020. By 2020, okay. Not so, later than 2020 was the phrasing. And is that doable? No, and, absolutely. Okay, and does he get his ideas from you about whether or not that's doable and, and what kind of space station we'll have, et cetera? Do you have conversations with him about uh, what it will look like? I, I have had, of course. The process of putting together presidential policy is uh, uh, an elaborate one. This particular date was picked uh, in company with my predecessor. It, okay. was, it was on the ground when I came in the door. Um, one of the reasons I was interested in taking the job was that I liked the policy that we had. So I, I think with uh, the current presidential space policy and the congressional authorization that followed it, I, I think that uh, the, the Congress has given us the best direction we've had in, in 45 years. But here's my worry about so. putting a space station up on the moon. Uh, an, out, an outpost. An um, outpost, yeah. an outpost out there. Uh, first of all, who owns the moon and who says that we get to put the outpost? Are there agreements with other nations that say that this outpost will be used by other people or are we going to get into territorial fights? Oftentimes, even uh, when the New World was settled, and I'm talking about America now, there were wars that occurred because people wanted to have a territory that was their own. Do you, do you see that as a possibility? Well, of course, anything is a possibility. I hope we're smarter now. Um, uh, we, there are United Nations treaties which recognize the right of all nations to uh, explore and, and utilize um, heavenly bodies. Um, when we return to the moon, almost certainly, uh, and I mean, I certainly hope that it will be part of an international partnership just as we okay. are leading on the space station. So in the nature of our plans to return to the moon, it will be an international and collaborative venture, I, I hope. And, so and I'm not, that, not that's, worried about that. I, that's not my biggest worry. I think in the long term, uh, just as with the new world, the expansion of Europeans into the new world, I, I think human beings over the decades and centuries will find um, that the other planets in the solar system play and will play an important role in the affairs of human beings. And when that occurs, it, it is possible that in, unless we can settle things ahead of time, that there would be, would be conflict over that. Right. And I, but I, I, ho I hope we'll be smarter. The other wonder that I have is that uh, humankind has not taken very good care of this earth. We have a lot of pollution. We've, we've used it up in, in many ways. And do you have policies and procedures now to think about sort of um, moon pollution? We do have uh, uh, agreements and protocols that are, are followed by all spacefaring nations uh, about controlling debris in space and uh, controlling the contamination of uh, uh, the moon and Mars and other bodies. But if humans are to use 
these things and explore them, there will be changes. Right. I don't think it's. I, I don't think it's quite fair to say we've used up the earth. Certainly, I, no, I not think, used it up. But I, I certainly think we have more, and we see maybe more uh, pollution than many of us are comfortable with, and and. Uh, I think people are recognizing that and state, taking steps to correct it, but I, I hardly think we're to the point where we've used everything up. But in, in sometimes here, expediency, such as overfishing or we need logging, and so we, we do things to our planet because there are some other good that we think. Um, and, and we need to think through the long-term right. consequences better than we sometimes do, and, and I'm all for that. And we have a second chance now. If we're going to do outer space, those are, in some ways, bright, pristine, not yet touched, and so humankind gets to start again in a way. Well, we can think through how we do these right. things a little more carefully. Uh, rather than having to make up for mistakes, maybe we can avoid them. Exactly. That's what we would hope for. Yes. Now, with a new president, uh, can a vision change? Can someone else come in and say, well, we're not going to go to the moon in 2020? I don't think that's a good <coughs> idea. Well, of course they can. Um, but I, I think it also needs to be remembered that in our system of government, um, the, uh, the bumper sticker expression is that presidents propose and Congress disposes. Oh. So a new president can propose a change to U.S. space policy. Um, we just had the first major change to U.S. Policy, space policy in decades uh, in 05 when the Congress enacted the, the NASA Authorization Act of 2005. Now, we don't get a new authorization act every year or, or necessarily you know, more than once or twice in a decade. So okay. it's, it's not common to, to pass a new law about what you want NASA to do, especially one as seminal as the authorization of Act of 05 was. So yes, of course, a president can propose a change and Congress can deliberate on it. Um, but for but an organization your size, you yeah, need to be able to NASA, sort of as I said earlier, NASA is a big boat with a small rudder, and uh, it's not helpful to the space program to be making changes all the time. Right. And, and I think most people understand that. Um, so, not and, and in addition, the authorization of Act of 05 was passed with enormously bipartisan support. Finally, you know, a president coming in to propose a change, um, if it were a change in a more aggressive direction, let's do more and go quicker. Uh, I'd certainly be happy about that. You would that. be happy about that. But that right. takes more money, and, right. and I'm not sure that, that that would be available. So the other direction is a president could propose to do less and take longer. Right. Well, that would look like a retreat. Right. And nobody wants a retreat. I, and and I, I just don't, I, personally, I don't see any sitting U.S. president or, frankly, any majority of Congress proposing that America will retreat from the space frontier and getting away with there it. There was an energy about frontier exploration back when Lewis and Clark uh, was uh, happened. Is there any negative about this push to a new frontier that you run across? Um, I've often said that for societies and even for species that uh, exploration, pushing the frontier is dangerous for individuals but productive for the race. Okay. Um, so the, fr uh, yeah, the, the front line the, person, that may may run the, into a bear, the, the, but... The, there used to be a saying that you could tell the pioneers because they had the arrows in the front. Oh. <laughs> uh, so it, it can be dangerous. It's, uh, our astronauts court significant risks as we learn how to live and work in space. Right. Uh, medical risks as well as, as technical risks, engineering risks. But if you had unmanned space exploration, would that be safer and is that something that's in the plan? Well, we d 30 percent, 32 percent of our budget this year is devoted to unmanned space exploration. So it's a both and. Sure, it's a, it's a, it's a both. Um, but, and of course it's safer um, because if there's no, if there are no people on board, then there is no danger. Uh, but that misses entirely the point. Um, I, I think best captured, I, my favorite quote on this point is by the former uh, chairman of, of the Lockheed Martin Corporation, Norm Augustine. Uh, whose name I think will be well known to many of your viewers and uh, Norm's now retired but f um, some years ago led a study on behalf of the US government about the future of the US space program and he pointed out that uh, it might be difficult to explain the difference but there is a difference between placing an instrumented package on top of Mount Everest right. and climbing Mount Everest. That's right. It's not and as dramatic 
as personal. It's not the story we want. And it's not the expansion no. of the human habitat. No. I, I think uh, I, I, I spent a good fraction of my life working on uh, unmanned uh, scientific space exploration. But I, and, and a good, good fraction in the human spaceflight program. I think people need to understand that we do, NASA is not a one trick pony. We do more than one thing, we serve more than one goal. One of the goals we serve is that of scientific discovery. Right. And, and we do it better than anyone. And that's I'm, what I. We're incredibly good at that. Another of our goals, another of our goals is to expand the human range of action. Okay, it's a separate goal. Um, it is as noble a goal, in my view, to expand the, the range of human presence. It's as noble as the goal of scientific discovery. It's just not the same goal. It isn't, but both are Both worthy. are important, both are important. Thank you, Michael. My guest today has been Michael Griffin, the 11th Administrator for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. I'm Shirley Hoekstra, and thank you for watching Inner Compass. Funding for Inner Compass is provided by Calvin College. The life that's unfolding. The world that awaits. Gifts that are yours to explore. And gods to use. It's all happening here at Calvin.